Greetings from Massachusetts. If you hear my accent a little bit come through tonight, the Massachusetts accent, no worries. I remember when I first moved there 30 years ago, someone got up and they were quoting the Lord Jesus from Revelation 1, and they said, I am the Alpha and Omega. <laughs> and everybody laughed. No, just I laughed. And so once in a while I have a good idea, but that's about it. Thank you for praying for me. I didn't know if I'd make it to the conference or not. Praise the Lord, things are going well, so I really appreciate your prayers. And I appreciate Justin's hospitality. I have been taken by Justin and his son Gentry to Bucky's. I have been taken to the Smokies. And I have been tasting cheese curdies. So I feel like I'm from the South. It was about two years ago, my friend Raymond was in the hospital dying of cancer. He had about two days to go, my age, and he was dying and on morphine, his family all around. And I went up to Raymond and I said, Raymond, it's Pastor Mike, I love you. And I said, do you know you're going to die? And he shook his head and I said, are you afraid? And I could still see him shake his head. And I said, why aren't you afraid? And he said, because the Lord Jesus has forgiven all my sins. When I went to visit him, do you think I should have asked questions like this? Raymond, how's your prayer life? Lots of nurses here, they need prayer. How's your evangelism? Are you preaching the gospel to doctors? Those are probably fine things to ask in an appropriate context. But what I wanted to say to Raymond was, and I did say, you know what, Raymond? There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. God has loved you with an everlasting love. What God has promised, he's faithful to accomplish. When I was in the hospital, thought I was gonna die of COVID, I think it was day 14 in the hospital. I wanted to pray, I wanted to evangelize, I wanted to read my Bible, but the most touching words that I heard from people, and of course this was back in COVID days, so no one could actually come into the hospital, Somebody called me and said, Mike, God loves you. He sent his son to die for you, and you can trust. Here's my question tonight, dear congregation. If those are good words on the deathbed, why aren't they good words while we're alive? Why aren't they good words while we're alive? I feel like I've got some halo. Are we okay for speaking? I'll just keep preaching. All right. And so I've got the topic tonight gospel assurance, and I'm happy to have the topic. Heidelberg Catechism asked this question, what is your only comfort in life and death? I think you probably know the answer. If not, it's a wonderful answer. That I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has satisfied fully for all my sins and redeemed me from the power of the devil. And so preserves me that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Wherefore, by his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. And so my question tonight is, do you have assurance? Do you know that when you die, you'll wake up in the presence of God? Are you dreading judgment day? Are you? Are you looking at it from the words of the Lord Jesus through comfort? I've done a radio show for quite a while. The number one question I used to get was, how do I find a good Bible teaching church? The number one question I get now is, how do I find a Christ-centered Bible teaching church? With a close second question, I don't have assurance. How can I have assurance of my salvation? Does God really love me? And so I have three messages on assurance. We have a lot of messages throughout the weekend on assurance, but my three are simple. I have an introductory message, that's tonight. I have a message on the objective side of assurance, who the Lord Jesus is. And then the subjective side of assurance, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness to our spirits, and also having evidences in our life as Christians. And every session, I will quote what's on the back of the, what color shirts are those? Orange? Seriously. Like, are, is like on sale cheap ones? They just, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not Texas 
Longhorns orange, burnt orange. What, what kind is it? Does anybody know? Salmon. Oh, salmon. Okay, excuse me. High in omega lipids. Good. When I look to myself, I don't know how I could be saved. But Martin Luther said, when I look to the Lord Jesus, I don't know how I can be lost. And that will be the theme of the conference. So this first session, I don't have a lot of verse-by-verse -verse teaching. We'll look at the Bible, of course, but it's an introduction. It's an introduction to my messages, and it's an introduction to all the conference. Introductory questions about assurance, and then my second question, uh, second uh, session, we'll get into uh, who the Lord Jesus on the objective side. So tonight, super simple, nine introductory questions, if you want to take notes, nine introductory questions about assurance to frame the conference a little bit so we're all thinking with the same definitions and the same vocabulary. Nine questions. Question number one, what is assurance? That's probably where we should start off, right? What is assurance? I mean, if you look at the English word, what's the root word found in the middle of the word assurance? And it's the English word sure. Are you sure? Are you certain that when you die, you'll wake up in the presence of God? Are you sure you're a Christian? Are you sure you're forgiven? Maybe my favorite definition is Bruce Derrimus' definition. The confidence of believers in Christ that notwithstanding their mortal sinful condition, they are irrevocably children of God and heirs of heaven. What a good definition. The confidence of believers in Christ that notwithstanding their mortal sinful condition, they are irrevocably children of God and heirs of heaven. It's the conviction that you know you're a child of God and you're a joint heir with Christ. It's the conviction that every one of your sins has been paid for. There's no double jeopardy. You'll never have to answer for another sin. Jesus, in fact, paid it all. And he said, it is finished. It's that confidence that Paul had, remember, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. That the Son of God loved me and gave, myself, gave himself for me. Right? The personal pronouns that Luther often talked about. That it wasn't just Jesus dying, but Jesus died for me. The Bible calls it full assurance of understanding, full assurance of hope, full assurance of faith. I mean, if we boil assurance down, it's probably the assurance that Jesus has you and you have him by faith, that you have the Lord Jesus and you have the hope of heaven. That's question number one, what is gospel assurance? Number two, is there a difference between security and assurance? Security of salvation and assurance? And the answer is yes, there is. What's the difference? Security we have in Christ Jesus and he has lived a life that we should have lived. Adam should have lived, Israel should have lived, but Jesus lived that life, right? Per uh, perpetually under the law, personally under the law, entirely under the law, exactly under the law. And he has lived for us and that he has also paid for our sins and that we are in Christ, we're secure. In God's eyes, we are secure. Assurance, on the other hand, is the confident realization of those promises, of the fact that it, it's true that Jesus did live for us, die for us, and was raised for us. Security is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Security is John chapter 10, I give them eternal life and they will what? Never perish. Security is John 6, all the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And assurance is a sense of that, an understanding of those promises that you know they apply to you. Number three, by the way, just between us, the first ones go fast, the last questions go really long. That was, by the way, the opposite of James Montgomery Boyce when he preached. If he had three points, he always made the first one the longest, the last two the shortest, because he thought the congregation might not have an attention span for a lot, uh, so he, he did it the opposite way. But I know you're out here on a Friday night and you want to know the Bible. By the way, one of the reasons why I know I'm a Christian is because I love what I used to hate and I hate what I used to love. Would you pay for a Bible conference uh, on a Friday night uh, when you were an unbeliever? Well, that doesn't make you a Christian now that you want to do it, but certainly now God has given you an appetite. And so to come out here Bible teaching, I commend you. Can believers have assurance? Question three. And the answer is, of course. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, probably one of the most famous verses on assurance. A whole book written about assurance. 
This is not a book about saving faith tests. This is a book granting you assurance. 1 John 5, 13, asking the question and answering it, can you have assurance of your salvation? Can you know for sure if you're saved beyond a reasonable doubt? Of course, you know John is writing, and he says in chapter 5, verse 13, I have to have the King James translation here in front of me. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I have a variety of translations, but you can know when you die, God will accept you into holy heaven. The judgment day is not to be dreaded by the Christian, as Turretin would say. Number four, number four. Is it rare to meet someone who's never struggled with assurance? Is it rare to meet someone who's never struggled with assurance? What I'm getting at is probably everyone here has struggled with assurance. And I'm trying to tell you this evening that you're not strange, that you're not odd, or that you're not weird. I don't know if I've ever said weirdo from the pulpit, but I'll say it tonight. You're not a weirdo if you've ever struggled with assurance. By the way, what on earth is perfect, by the way? Is anything perfect? Could our assurance be perfect? It was Thomas Brooks, the Puritan, that wrote, Our knowledge of God, of Christ, and ourselves, and of the blessed scripture, is imperfect in this life. And how then can our assurance be perfect? When I share with people, I've written some books on assurance, and that I've struggled with assurance before, in an odd way, they're very, very happy that I've struggled with assurance at times. Why? Because they realize they have struggled and they're not the one who's the odd person out. And the same thing happened with me. When I found out one of my favorite theologians had struggled with assurance, it kind of made me happy. It, 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 it kind of gave me some relief. And years ago I thought, St. Clair Ferguson said, if you ever find the 16 volume Banner of Truth, green John Owen set, buy it because it will be unmarked. Every theologian wants to have that set in his uh, library, but no one reads it. And so I thought, I'm going to read those books. And so I'm up to about seven volumes read. I didn't meet a man once in my life, and he said, I've read all 16 volumes. I said, where in the world did you have the time to do that? He said, prison. <laughs> okay, good. I commend you, sir. Would you like to be my bodyguard? Owen said, John Owen said, I preached, my, I preached Christ for some years, but I had very little, if any, experimental acquaintance with access to God through Christ. He said he had a horror and darkness sometimes in his walk. And there's a psalm that really, really helped him. Turn to that psalm, Psalm 130, please. And when Owen read this psalm and reflected, he said God graciously relieved his spirit. Psalm 130. 30. I think we have a modern Christmas, a Christian song of Psalm 130. My point really is not does everybody struggle with assurance, but here's something very helpful when it comes to assurance. Psalm 130. This is the ESV. Of course, when you see all caps for Lord, that's his personal covenant keeping name, and you'll see in verse 2 smaller letters of O-R-D in the word Lord, that's Adonai, our king, so both are used here. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And that was balm for the soul of John Owen. It's a balm for your soul as well. Some Christians just struggle more than others, but it is not odd to struggle with assurance. Number five, question five. Can people have false assurance? Can people have false assurance? 
And again, we'll get into some verse by verse study soon enough, but right now I'm just trying to set the table with these introductory questions. Can people have false assurance? And the answer is yes. There is something as a temporary faith, a false faith, a demon faith. Of course, we want to be careful. People say they're Christians and there's no fruit or no evidence. There is a false assurance. I mean, isn't that the worst lie maybe in the world of the father of lies, Satan, making you think you're going to go to heaven when you die, but you end up not going? Was it not John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress? When coming to the gates of heaven in Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan said, at the gates of heaven, there was a porthole to hell for people not trusting in the Lord Jesus. That's a diabolical strategy, right? Both to convince lost people they're saved and to convince saved people they're lost. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The spiritual is true when they say everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. If you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there's a list of people here that have been changed, of course, but Paul tries to make sure that these Corinthians understand something. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, kind of in a different, a different epistle, there's lots of questions being asked and answered, and I don't know if you've ever tried to teach somebody that thinks they know everything. When I was growing up, I watched Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons. How many people are old enough to admit it? Rocky and Bullwinkle. Uh, Boris and Natasha, they were in there too. And they had a guy that knew everything, and he's called Mr. What? He's called Mr. Know-It-All. And that was the Corinthian church. Over and over and over, Paul would say to them, don't you know, don't you know, don't you know, don't you know? Sounds like the Bill Withers song. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Remember that song? This is a rough crowd, by the way. <laughs> Ain't no sunshine when I'm gone, right? I know, I know, I know, I know. They thought they knew everything, but they didn't know. What's something that they should have known, but they don't know? Found right here, verse 9 of chapter 6 in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know? By the way, you should know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Why does he say that? Because it's easy to be deceived. Your heart can trick you. You have friends. You have relatives that are like this list here, and you don't want the doom over their head. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, two Greek words there, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. So there's a false assurance. People can say that they're Christians, but if this is their lives, this is what characterizes them, and of course, you know the good news here in verse 11. I can't just stop there. And such were some of you. You were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Those are the kind of people that God washes. They're unclean and He, and he washes. Uh, they're doing things improperly and now they're set apart for wonderful things, sanctified and they're justified in the name of Jesus and the Spirit of our God. Number six, why is assurance important? Why is assurance important? The Westminster Assembly thought it was so important that, by the way, 25 of its members wrote on faith and assurance. That's a lot. It's like one-tenth of the men who put together the Westminster Standards wrote on faith and assurance. Why is it important? Well, it's important, number one, because to get real assurance, you're going to have to stop nasal gazing. You're going to have to stop navel gazing. It's easy to do, and looking by faith the Lord Jesus is harder. It's important because, as you know, the joy of assurance is wonderful. Those seasons in your life when you have assurance, you think, oh, this is the best of the best. It was 1653 when Joseph Carlyle wrote, the greatest thing we can desire next to the glory of God is our own salvation. And the sweetest thing we can desire is the assurance of our salvation all saints shall enjoy a heaven when they leave this earth. Some saints enjoy a heaven while they are here on this earth. Say long. Assurance is important because it frees you up to do everything that you need to do as a Christian. From experiencing trials and temptation to ministry and to service. 
Show me someone that doesn't know they're saved, and I'll show you someone that's handicapped when it comes to doing good works. Because they're consumed with the idea, am I even a Christian? How can I serve the Lord and worship the Lord and, and do things in the local church when I don't even know I'm saved? Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan, said, a Christian who has full assurance of faith is ten times more active than people that are not. So if you don't have assurance right, you get a lot of things wrong and you're stumbling in your ministry. Kind of a, a spiritual hypochondriac just focusing on yourself. Number seven. What are the different kinds of assurance? I made mention of this earlier, and so I'll say it again just for emphasis. Objective and subjective. In that order. By the way, most of us here do it in the opposite order, but it's the right order of objective. Who is Jesus? Subjective. What is the Spirit of God doing in my life? When it comes to the Westminster Confession of Faith, they said, here's what you look for for assurance. Three things. The divine truth of the promises of salvation. That's objective. The inward evidence of those graces under which these promises are made. Subjective. Subjective. And the testimony of the spirit of adoption, witnessing with our spirits that we are children of God. And so first we look by faith to the Lord Jesus. That's objective, his person, his work, his love, his promises. And then we look to see the spirit of God's work in our life. Do we cry out, Abba, Father? And are there fruits? Uh, by the way, just a little Spurgeon side note. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, enough of this Westminster Confession. Let's have a Spurgeon quote. <laughs> Spurgeon said, when you chase the dove of assurance, it flies away. Am I assured? Am I assured? I, I don't have assurance. I need assurance. I study assurance. I study assurance. I, do I have enough fruit? Do I have enough of, of evidence? I must have fruit and vegetables. <laughs> do I have enough fruit? But he said, when you look to the Lord Jesus Christ in the Scriptures by faith, the dove of assurance settles down on your shoulder. That's why in my ministry in Massachusetts, the ministry the Lord has given to me, if someone comes to me and says, you know, by the way, Pastor Mike, I'm really struggling with anxiety. I don't usually give them a book on how to overcome anxiety. Uh, Pastor, I'm struggling with depression. I usually don't give them a book about depression. What do you think I give them? Oh, we might talk about that some, that's true. But I usually ask them, when's the last time you read a book about Jesus? When's the last time you read a book about Jesus? I was with St. Clair Ferguson years and years ago, and I first was starting to write. And so he said, Mike, tell me about your ministry. I said, I, I explained it. And then he said, you know, you're writing some books? Yes. He said, what, what are the topics? I said, well, they're both about Jesus. And I wish I could give you the Scottish Brogue, but he said, they'll never sell. I'm like, oh, he's Mr. Encouragement, typical Scott. But A, he was right. They didn't sell. He didn't mean I was a bad writer, although I, I think I was. But he meant people don't like to read books about Jesus. Because they want how-to. They want application. They want just tell me the three things to do. Just fix the problem. By the way, for those of you that aren't pastors and you come into counseling... Counseling is not fix my problem. If you say, I'm going to go to the pastor, I want my problem fixed. Translation, I want my wife to do what I want her to do. <laughs> or vice versa. That's not real counseling. If you don't understand biblical roles and you want the Bible taught to you, and I have to think theologically, fine, fine, and fine. But a lot of counseling is simply, I know you're going through a hard time, but let's remember who the Lord Jesus is. He's faithful. You can trust him. He's good. And so one of the things I want to encourage you to do, dear congregation, is read books about the Lord Jesus. Every problem is solved in a Christological fashion. And maybe one of the ways you can start is just reading the Gospels of the Lord Jesus, the good news about Jesus and the Gospels. When the last time you read a Gospel? If you add up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are 89 chapters that show you his person, his work, his promises, how he acts. It's wonderful to do. I think, why is there so much about the life of Jesus? Well, it's telling you this is how a real human should act, a true human, a perfect human. This is how Adam should have acted. This is how Israel should have acted. 
And all of a sudden you start having your eyes on the Lord Jesus. You're forgetting about yourself. And that dove of assurance just settles in. Should you read books on assurance? Absolutely. But the good books on assurance, like Joel Beakey's, like Louis Burkhoff's, I guess I can, for, it's bad form to promote your own book, but since I didn't write any of the book, I just compiled it. I tried to pick authors that talked about the Lord Jesus. Not just how to get your assurance, but how to set your mind and fix your hope completely on the grace to be given to you, the Lord Jesus, grace and courage. Number eight. Okay, I've been waiting for these last two. Everything's been a lead up to these last two. I feel like I need to get in a three-point stance. By the way, I'm from the University of Nebraska, I'm a corn husker. And in the old days, we won a lot, but I can't remember the last time we won a game, so it doesn't matter. Although we still go to football games in Nebraska. You don't have conferences on weekends when Nebraska plays a home game on Saturday because nobody will show up. Are the balls playing tomorrow? <laughs> they are at home? At 3 o'clock at home? Oh, Missouri, all right. Number eight. What's been the history, the struggle for assurance? It's good to study church history. What's been the history? Let's especially look at the Reformation. What's the history of the struggle of assurance, especially in the Reformation period? Did you know the Roman Catholic Church taught and teaches that it is a sin to have assurance? It is called the sin of presumption. The sin of presumption. And Cardinal Bellarmine, back in the day during the Reformation, Luther's Day said, it is the principal heresy of the Protestants. The principal heresy, did you get that? Not minor, but major heresy. In the Catholic Encyclopedia, by the way, where I live in Massachusetts, 80% of the people call themselves Catholic. The Catholic Encyclopedia defines assurance called the sin of presumption this way, quote, it may be defined as the condition of a soul that because of a badly regulated reliance on God's mercy and power, hopes for salvation without doing anything to deserve it or for pardon of his sins without repenting of them. Now, one of the things I appreciate about Rome during the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, they understood what the Reformation taught. This is exactly right. What is assurance? A reliance on God's mercy, power, hopes, and salvations without doing anything to deserve it? That's exactly what it is. But they call that a sin. Now, they did say a few people get to have assurance of salvation. Any guesses who that first person might be? Oh, good thought, but I was thinking more of the Virgin Mary. She gets it because, well, she's Mary. Paul gets it because there's revelation. Remember, he was caught up into the third heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Why in the world would they say you can't have any assurance? They would say things like, if you say no matter what the future holds, I'm saved. That's a sin. I'd say to myself, what are they doing? It's dangerous to say that. It's not desirable to say that. Listen to what the Council of Trent says. If anyone says that he will for certain, with an absolute and infallible certainty, have that great gift of perseverance unto end, unless he has learned this by special revelation, let him be damned or anathema. If anyone says justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, let him be anathema. Why would they do that? Well, I think one answer is simple. If you get away from the sacrament of penance that's distributed through a local priest, money is going to be lost. Power is going to be lost. Profits are going to be lost. They think it makes people prideful and presumptuous. But here's the main issue. If you tell people there's nothing you can do to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain, then those kind of people are going to take advantage of grace and are going to become antinomian. 
That was Rome's real concern. And one of the great things about the Reformation studies, for those of you that study the Reformation, you think it's a recovery of the, of, of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. It's a recovery of, of the doctrine that the will is bound. But did you know one of the great recoveries of the Reformation was recovering the doctrine of assurance? I think one of the books we have here, edited by Brooke Parsons, says that in that very book, Sinclair Ferguson. In some senses, the Reformation was the great discovery and rediscovery of assurance. And I want you to know, dear congregation, dear Christian, do you think God likes to give assurance? Do you think God loves to give assurance? Or do you think he likes to hold it back? I don't know about you, but I have four children. Haley is 30, Luke is 27, Maddie is 24, and Gracie is 22. They're still not sure my, they're my children because I haven't confirmed that yet because I want to make sure they obey enough in order that they will become my children. Like, what a weirdo you are. You've said weirdo twice tonight. Joel Beakey, what would you think of an earthly father who kept his son and daughter in doubt for many years as to whether he was their real father? God loves to give assurance. He's not trying to take it away. It was Rome that took away assurance to control people and to get money. Period. If you meet a Roman Catholic, by the way, one of the greatest ways you can, you can evangelize, besides talking obviously about the Lord Jesus, is to tell them you can know for sure. You can know that you can know that you can know that you have eternal life. You don't have to purify yourself. You don't have to go through temporal punishment. You don't have to go to purgatory. Simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Lastly, number nine. Hey, we're going to make it through. We're going to make it through. The longest sermon I've ever preached in my life is 92 minutes. You say, why 92? Well, I always ask the pastor, how long should I preach? Because I don't want to preach longer than the preaching pa the regular pastor. He said, I preach 92 minutes. So I asked him, why 92 minutes? He said, well, we have cassettes that we record. You know, we'll, learn, we'll teach the young ones what cassettes are later. But <laughs> They were 90-minute cassettes, but 90-minute cassettes were really 92 minutes because it was 46 minutes on each side. So at 46 minutes, he flips it over and you keep going until 92, 92 done. Number nine, why do some modern evangelical teachers and preachers withhold assurance? It's my last question for the introduction tonight. We'll get more into the Bible here in the next message, but I wanted to frame things tonight. Why do some Protestants and evangelical pastors and teachers withhold assurance? Well, I have many reasons. Maybe one, they don't understand law gospel. Maybe they don't understand that they're supposed to feed the sheep of God, so they don't understand ecclesiology, how the church should function. Maybe they don't think the gospel motivates Maybe they think just law motivates. Maybe they're afraid that there can be some nominal Christians. But the issue, I believe, in my opinion, why don't evangelical pastors try to give more assurance regularly? They do it for the same reason that Rome does it, is because they're afraid of lawlessness. They're afraid of unholy living. They're afraid that people are going to take advantage of grace. They're going to somehow think that if Jesus paid it all, that I can do anything I want. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. I especially see this kind of teaching in Federal Vision Circles, New Perspective on Paul, and Final Justification Advocates. And we'll maybe talk about those later, but it's around evangelical circles. And so I want you to go to Romans 5, this great epistle. And let's work through Romans 5 just a little bit as we think about assurance and should we be afraid of lawlessness. Does grace make people sin or does it motivate people to obey? Romans 5. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we hope we will have peace with God in the future through our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I misread that. Did anybody catch that? Okay. Let me try that again. Therefore, since we have received only the initial stage of justification. Oh, I did it again. Sorry. Therefore, we shall have peace with God after we have been sufficiently sanctified. It doesn't say any of those. It says since we have been justified by faith, we have, present tense, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And more than that, we have access. 
If you're a Christian, I want you to know, when God declares you righteous, you can't be any more righteous. Even in heaven, you won't be more righteous in the declaration of God's court. Because you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ credited to your account. How could there be anything more righteous than Jesus, the inherent righteous one, who then on earth merits righteousness for others? Once you're justified, you are as righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can talk about union and other things with Jesus as well. Your pastor is not more justified than you are. Your favorite celebrity is not more justified than you are. You are justified. You've been washed, sanctified, justified. Back to Spurgeon because we should get another amen with Spurgeon. Amen. <laughs> The moment a, Christ, a, a person believes in Christ, his pardon, at once he receives, his sins are no longer his. They're cast into the depths of the sea. They're gone. That man stands a guiltless man and accepted in the beloved. What say you? Do you mean that literally? Spurgeon, yes I do. That is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. You think about the language of scripture so we can try to understand how God forgives. Do you think God is a reluctant get forgiver? How does God give forgiveness? Kind of doesn't want to do it. Think of Micah chapter 7. He, he casts or hurls sins overboard. Doesn't kind of just nicely drop them over, sets them down. It's language so you can think God is not a reluctant, stingy giver. Nor a reluctant, stingy forgiver. Through one man's obedience, the many will be constituted righteous. Skip a few chapters to Romans chapter 8. I call this maybe the most shocking verse in all the Bible. Could there be better assurance than Romans chapter 8 verse 1? Romans 8 verse 1. I'm sure you've memorized it. There is now therefore no condemnation. That's the opposite of justification, right? The antonym of justification is condemnation. Courtroom language. For those who are in Christ Jesus. But there might be condemnation later. Kind of two-step justification, final justification. No. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Past sins paid. Present sins paid. Future sins paid. You can't be unforgiven. You can't be unreconciled. You can't be unredeemed. We'll hear from Josh. Blessed are those lawless deeds that have been forgiven when he preaches tomorrow. So man, he said, in Roman Catholic doctrine, assurance is a sin. In a lot of Protestant evangelicalism, it's a duty. And in the New Testament, it's a fact. It's just a fact. Assurance focused on Christ and not our performance. Don't you love the song? We even love Wesley's songs sometimes when they're biblical, right? Did I just say that? Yep. What do I care? I throw out a grenade or two tonight and tomorrow and I fly back home. <laughs> I know I'm going to make it because I flew here to Allegiant, but I fly home on American, so we're going to make it. No condemnation, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Horatius Bonar said Romans chapter 8 verse 1 is unguarded because it's meant to shock you. What do you mean Romans chapter 7? I don't even do what I want to do. I, I, I still sin as a Christian. But there's no condemnation for those in Christ. That's exactly right. Because as John Bunyan said, my righteousness has been up in heaven for 1800 years. And I have that. Okay, so in the time I have left, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a quote. You're going to tell me if it's good news or bad news. Then I'll tell you who said it. Because if I tell you who said it first, it's going to be your favorite celebrity. And then you're going to say it has to be true. And my name is wrong. But I want you with your own lips to say, no, that's not true. And my point here is not to be judgmental or extreme or anything like that. But even good men, evangelical men, godly men, some of these, can teach the wrong thing when it comes to assurance. And they are somehow going to make assurance tied to faith in Christ and how much transformation you have in your life. 
Your holy living is not your Savior. Your obedience is not your Savior. Jesus saves. And of course, out of gratitude and thanksgiving, do we want to obey? Since God is holy, do we want to be holy? Of course. It has nothing to do with being unholy or not unholy. We all strive as Christians to want to work. But we're not going to put those works up with Christ's works. And we're not going to put our works on the final day of judgment either. Because God only accepts perfection. God only accepts perfection. So we're not going to lower the law to somehow make it so that you know, we're saved by faith uh, through faith alone, but then on that last day, there's going to be some great transformation in our lives that has been proof. Exhibit one. Is this good news or bad news? The exclusive ground of justification of the believer in the state of justification is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What do you think the next word is going to be? But. His obedience, which is simply the perseverance of the saints, in the way of truth and righteousness is necessary to his continuing in a state of justification. Good news or bad news? You have to say that's bad news. That's Rome. And that's Norman Shepherd, who taught at Westminster Philly for years until men like Robert Gottfried stood up and said, you can't teach that because you're teaching justification by faithfulness. And out Norman Shepherd goes. But he's influenced Bonson and many others, and so it still is around. Exhibit two. Since obedience to God in Christ is a condition of our continuance in the state of justification, did you get that? By the way, if that's true, how are you doing? Let's just cut to the chase. How are you doing in your obedience? Well, let me ask your wife. How are you doing? How is he doing? Since obedience to Christ, to God in Christ, is a condition or of continuance in a state of justification of our not losing it, and our perseverance therein is a condition of our appearing in that state before the Lord at our departure hence. That's not good news. That's Richard Baxter in the Deformed Pastor book. Excuse me, the Reformed Pastor book. Not, not to be reading Richard Baxter. Why do you think he had to go make so many house calls? Because he has to make house calls and visit people. Nothing wrong with visiting. But he has to make sure they're obeying the extra laws that he gives them. His methodology is directly tied to his theology. Exhibit three. When you ask on how a person can be right with God, this man answers this way. The stunning Christian answer is sola fide, faith alone. But be sure to hear this carefully and precisely. He says, right with God by faith alone, not attain heaven by faith alone. So you're saved by faith alone, but you do not attain heaven by faith alone. Is that good news or bad news? It's bad news. And it's John Piper. Why, why, why does John say that? What is going on? Piper says, quote, in justification, faith receives a finished work of Christ performed outside of us and counted as ours. In final salvation at the last judgment, Faith is confirmed by the sanctifying fruit it has borne, and we are saved through that fruit and through that faith. Why don't we just go back to how the Reformed and the Puritans talk? You're saved by faith alone, and that faith, what? Won't be alone. Why don't we talk the old-fashioned way about works? They're not the ground, but they're the evidence, and they're the fruit. I could ask you a question. I could ask John Piper a question. Who's lived such a life that when they get to heaven, they can say, I've merited heaven? What does union with Christ mean? Does it mean we get judged at the end for our performance? What does it mean for Jesus to be our federal head? Another man asks, do you need more righteousness than Christ's righteousness to attain heaven? How transformed must your life be before you can stand before God? Benjamin Keach said, once we're justified, we need not inquire how a man is justified after he is justified. And I think Benjamin Keach is justified for justifully saying that. I mean, if you want to think how God's saved, you can even look back and you can think, okay, even some of the confessions. We don't have Jesus half a Savior, like the two-step process to get saved through the Red Sea. No. Machen said, if Christ provides only part of our salvation, leaving us to provide the rest, we're hopeless under the load of sin. I, I wonder, if you're a pastor here, 
do you preach in such a way that the congregation, the Christians walk out saying, I'm encouraged today to know I'm in Christ Jesus? Or do you want to be one of those kind of flame-throwing pastors and you're going to say, you know, you call yourself a Christian? We'll find out. You say, well, I have to deal with sin. Of course you do. But what does every good father do or mother do after they've spanked or corrected a child? Get out of the room. I don't want to see you again. Even sinful parents know better. You discipline. And what do you do afterward? I love you. Thankful, you're my child. Why, if you do this, why would you say, I want to try to take away assurance and make people think, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not? Frankly, that's bad preaching. If Christians say, I don't know if I'm a Christian anymore based on that sermon, that's bad preaching. That's called means of scolding, not means of grace, because we're offering Christ Jesus, who died for the sins of Christians too. Of course, preach. Rebuke, exhort. I regularly say, dear Christian, God loves you. And then people in the congregation, if they're not a Christian, I'm not talking to them. Okay. I'm going to go for five more minutes because you talked for five minutes without a microphone and then had to redo it. <laughs> so he took five minutes of my time. I've never preached before with copies of my books up here. Let's just get rid of those. You told me there'd be no altar calls here, and you just had people coming up all the time. (laughs) Big point. When you hear preaching, I just want you to say, is that good news or bad news? And good news is talking about the Lord Jesus, grace incarnate, the eternal Son, became flesh. One of my favorite commentaries that I use all the time. But a man said this. Verses 12 and 13 of Romans 8 cap off this proclamation of life in Christ. By reminding us that God's gift of eternal life does not cancel the complementary truth that only by progressing in holiness that will eternal life be attained. Is that good news? That is not good news. When people say, if you still struggle with the same, I heard a big evangelical say this the other day, if you still struggle with the same sins that you committed 30 years ago as you do now, you ought not to call yourself a Christian. Really? Lust of the eyes, self-righteousness, pride, arrogance. Part of being a Christian is we struggle with those things. It was in Romans commentary, page 472 in Doug Moose, Romans commentary. I could go on and on and on. If you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a mom or dad, the best thing you can do is talk about the Lord Jesus. And it is simple faith. It's a understanding who Jesus is intellectually, an assent to that, and then a trust. Because it has nothing to do with our faith. It's the object of our faith. And I don't want you to turn into a Roman Catholic functionally by taking away assurance. And probably what will help you more than anything is if you can grapple with this fact. Answer this question in your mind and then in your ministry or in your home. Does grace lead to unholy living? Because our default is, yes, it does. If I watch you preach, I'll say, you think it does. And you think law is the way to motivate. And it's been said many times, it's not original with me. Law has no motivation. Law has no animating power. It just tells us, like the GPS, go that way. How do you get to Knoxville? Not by the GPS, but there has to be an engine. And the engine to get you there, gets you there. And the engine for all Christian obedience is not law. Did you hear me? It's not law. It's who the Lord Jesus is. To find someone who would love me like that? I have been married for over 34 years, and I met this young lady, and I was 29, she was 24. I I asked her to marry me on May 6th, and we got married on June 6th, same year, 1989. You say, what were you doing? 
told my kids, don't do what I do, by the way. So my son just got married this year. He was engaged for 45 days. So at least he's growing, progressing, better than his dad. Looking back, one of the reasons why I married her in 30 days is because she'd eventually find out how bad I was on the inside. And maybe she'd say no. If she really knew what I was like. So I thought, I'm going to marry someone who is pretty and they keep their word. Because once she says I do, she means I do. And can you imagine the God of the universe who's learned nothing, knew every single sin you'd ever commit? Every one. Those ones in the skeleton closet that you don't want anybody to know. And he loved you. And he sent his son to die for you. What would Jesus say if he walked in when you were committing the worst sin you've ever committed? If you think back with the worst sin you've ever committed and he walked in, what would he say? He'd say, I'm holy, that sin, sin is repulsive, but I love you and I'm going to pay for that sin so you can have reconciliation. If that doesn't make you want to evangelize and to pray and to sing and to be motivated, I don't know what would. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for tonight. Thank you for these dear people. I pray that everyone here who's a Christian would have wonderful assurance. And those that are here tonight that aren't Christians, I pray that you would not give them any sleep or any rest until they trust in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.